To me, inclusion and diversity means accepting people irrespective of their race, their color, their cultural background, and their religion and opinions. I personally embrace IND by trying not to be judgmental of or prejudiced towards people who are different from myself and my family. In this global world where we are born in one country and we might end up working and living in another one, being inclusive helps us to adapt to different social scenarios and also helps us build strong personal and professional relationships. Hello everyone, I'm Dawn. ND means a lot to me. It means respect, openness, fairness, transparency, collaboration. In my daily work, I try my best to create an environment for our team to feel free to speak up and also collaborate for better results. So I have been engaged in IND since the very beginning. I think it's very important for our world because IND will be able to unlock everyone's potential to contribute a better world in future. Thank you. Inclusion and diversity to me means a sense of belonging and equality, that it doesn't matter what your background, that different groups or individuals are unique and that all are culturally and socially accepted and welcomed. I try to make a conscious effort to not prejudge anyone on their differences, but rather celebrate the fact that we're all unique. We live in a global community and more and more we are working and living with people that have different backgrounds and personal experiences. If we can embrace those differences, we can learn and grow to become a more welcoming and understanding society. Inclusion and diversity is the way that we as a society welcome and promote equal treatment and opportunities to everyone regardless of our differences. I embrace IND by listening and respecting everyone's opinions. I believe these two concepts are key in today's interconnected world because they encourage knowledge transfer by bringing different solutions and perspectives to the everyday's problem. IND means you and me and all of us. Um, I'm trying to embrace IND by purposely looking past the book cover when I speak to someone and just looking for the content inside. And I think it's important for the world because everyone wants to feel like they belong. They want to feel valued. For me, inclusion and diversity is about understanding, about being considerate, and learning, learning about each other and how we can work better together. Let's keep in mind though that socially, DAO must change, DAO must continue to adapt and nothing really changes unless we share and let people know what we need. So remember with your boss, with your EDP and uh, with HR as well, your, your situation, what you need, how you can be effective, you need to share that. Make sure that people are aware and um, then we all get better, we're all more understanding, and we all move forward together. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our Into Diversity event, DAO Australia and New Zealand's flagship inclusion and diversity event for 2020. Welcome also to our customers and partners here in Australia, New Zealand, it is really great to have you with us today, more than ever in these extraordinary times. We are really grateful that you are with us. Um, welcome also to those of you joining us from far and wide. We have colleagues from not only across Asia Pacific, Singapore, China, but also colleagues from the United States as well. Thank you for joining us. Some housekeeping first, um, I do need to let you know that we are recording today's event uh, with the intention of sharing it on Dow's internal social media platforms. Um, in the unlikely event that we lose you, uh, please hang in there, any technical glitches, uh, rest assured that we will be back very shortly. Today's safety moment um, will be about psychological safety, and it will be an interactive one. So we would like today's event to be interactive, and we are using an online polling website, um, menti.com, to run a few polls throughout the event. So to start things off, please um, grab your phone, your device, 
and into your web browser, type menti.com. You see it on the screen now, M-E-N-T-I.com, into your browser, and then type in the code that is appearing on your screen right now um, to access the website, and then go ahead and answer our first question, which is all about connecting with how you are feeling. So connect with how you're feeling and answer the question quite simply in a few words, how are you feeling today? All of your responses will start to appear on the screen in real time as all of our participants um, feed them in. So while you're doing that, I also would like to encourage you to raise questions throughout the event uh, to our guest speakers um, or for our reflection at the end. And to do that, please text your questions or email through to Rebecca Sims. Uh, the text number and the email are coming up on your screen right now. So please, at any time throughout the event, feel free to send through a question either by text or email. So here in Australia, you may know that today is our national Are You OK Day. Uh, this is run annually by the charity Are You OK? It encourages all of us to support and connect in a meaningful way with those around us, whether at home, at work, um, in our social lives or in our community all through life's ups and downs, and to not be afraid to ask someone if they're doing okay, and particularly um, if you suspect that they're not. So it's not a coincidence today that the theme of our event is to address the links between inclusion and diversity, the connections that we all need to get a sense of belonging, and how that connects to mental health. So we will be touching on some pretty emotional topics and you know, while meaningful connections with those close to us are of course vital, at, at, at times when we need help, it can sometimes be easier to reach out to someone that we don't know. So after today's event, we will be sharing a number of helpful resources that can be accessed uh, by phone or online. So now let's have a look at those responses from our first poll question on how we're all feeling today. And uh, this word map, mostly, mostly positive, excited, happy, good, hopeful, positive, <coughs> great, grateful, um, fantastic, uh, tired, um, terrific. Um, actually, that's really motivating, I have to say. Enjoying the sunshine, yes. Uh, we do have some lovely sun in Melbourne today. Um, so, yeah, actually not um, other than stressed, um, most of the comments here are really quite encouraging. Busy, yes, challenged, absolutely. So, thank you. Um, that's it's great to, to get a little bit of practice and uh, connect with how, how we're feeling to start off the session. What does inclusion and diversity mean for Dow? Um, obviously, you know, we, we, we in Dow know that inclusion is one of the four pillars that make up Dow's ambition to be the most innovative, customer-centric, sustainable, and inclusive material science company, and to be an industry leader in inclusion and diversity. So look, without an inclusive culture, we, we would not be the company we are today. A worldwide Dow's more than 35,000 colleagues, um, plus our many more customers and partners, of course, represent a, a huge variety of races, religions, gender identity, educational backgrounds, um, languages, experiences, sexual orientations, and, and, and cultures. But the passion to use science to meet both day-to-day -day needs as well as to solve the world's most pressing challenges is what brings us together. And we know that we do draw on 
different perspectives and experiences from all of those around us to create a culture that really allows us to be our authentic selves, to be and to do our best and, and to really achieve amazing things together. In this time of COVID-19, um, as we are forced, many of us, to stay apart from those that we usually share our physical space with, be it friends, family, colleagues, we are reminded of how much we value a respectful environment and a supportive network of people around us. At Dow, you know, we've, we've been pretty fortunate to already have had the technology to enable those of us required to work from home, to stay productive, um, to stay connected, and to actually see each other's faces. And look, while in some ways we have actually been surprised at how well we have adapted and how the new regime has even in, in some strange ways brought new insights and nuances to our relationships. But we do need to watch that those around us don't feel isolated, vulnerable or excluded. And you know, to this end, we, we have worked hard this year in, in Dow ANZ to offer activities and resources that encourage all of us to maintain a positive mental, emotional and, and physical health. Let me say a word about Dow's employee resource groups, our ERGs, um, which is the employee-led structure through which inclusion and diversity is driven through our company globally. As the term ERG is relatively new in our lexicon, but in my own experience, you know, Dow has always been a leader in diversity and inclusion. And I know we have some multi-generational diversity on, on the uh, call here today. Um, so I know that I'm not alone when I recall way back in the day when diversity was genuine, but more straightforward. It generally meant gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation. It, it's come a long way in three decades. And, you know, we now have 10 ERG groups in Dow globally that represent the many dimensions of social diversity, each with a senior executive sponsor and most with local chapters throughout the world. They bring together people to share experiences, to foster a sense of belonging and respect. They help to reverse the systemic prejudices and the unconscious biases. And they promote the value of employees' contributions and provide a forum you know, to tell our stories and encourage connections with colleagues having similar experiences. The participation in these resource groups is, is open to all Dow employees and contractors, and it is actually expected for Dow leaders. A great example of this is how Dow rallied through the acts against racism and discrimination after the events that we all saw unfolding in the United States a few months back. Our ERGs and, and leadership encouraged us all to think really deeply about how the concept of race and racism relates to all of us um, and helped frame how we can all become better allies and act for what is right. A few years ago, you know, we saw Dow make a very deliberate shift to put inclusion ahead of diversity, subtle, right, from diversity and inclusion to inclusion and diversity. But it brought with it a more sophisticated approach to integrating these principles in the way we run our business. We saw the appointment of our first inclusion and diversity officer in the company, and we created regional directors, dedicated roles in all of the regions. And we also created the global eMERGE conference that was held in Houston in 2008 and again in 2009, which included participants from Australia who came back and shared the amazing experience with, with the rest of us. So even prior to COVID, uh, the decision had already been made to translate the concepts of eMERGE and drive it 
down to local events, led, organized by the local ERG chapters in order to be more relevant and more accessible, which in itself is more inclusive. And that's what this day is for us here in ANZ. It is our flagship inclusion event for 2020 in this truly bizarre year, which has made all of us pause and rethink about what really matters. We are grateful to be here together, to be working, uh, and to have all of our customers working in business and close by with us. A few words about our presenters today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, today's event falls on Are You OK Day in Australia, and our theme is to highlight the link between an inclusive and diverse culture and a mentally healthy workplace. It's more relevant now than ever before. So today I'm really proud to welcome our two fabulous guest speakers, Kate Meadows and Wayne Schwartz. Both are renowned and passionate mental health advocates. Now, Kate is well known to us in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, she is a workplace mental health consultant who has worked extensively with us, um, with the corporate and education fields and with us this year on various programs to support our mental health program. From our Asia Pacific first mental health first aid training uh, to guidance on how to check in with yourself and those around you and uh, our recent MindFit program as well. So Kate will speak to us today about mental health continuum, the factors that can protect against suicide and how to start an are you okay conversation. Wayne, um, Wayne may be known to some of you from his distinguished AFL career spanning 14 years and is also from New Zealand. So there you go, that, that's a, an unusual com combination. He is the founder of Pucker Up. Uh, Pucker Up is a social enterprise that works with organizations to educate and empower them to start conversations with their teams around mental health and suicide prevention and to provide practical tools and strategies to help them manage their well-being. And Wayne will talk about how an inclusive culture promotes mental health and well-being. So I hope that you enjoy our event today and take away something truly meaningful. So please get involved. Once again, um, take part in our mentee polls when Kate and Wayne invite you to do so. And please text your questions and comments through to Rebecca. The text number and the email address will pop up periodically on your screens throughout the course of the event. So thank you and Kate, it's over to you. Hi everybody, Kate Meadows here from Be More Mindful. Uh, I am really proud and feel very privileged to be here today to join the Dow team. Uh, I have a very strong relationship with the, with the uh, Dow network here in Australia and New Zealand, and I think today is going to be a wonderful event. So I'm just I'd like to actually take you through uh, some key information when it comes to looking after yourself, but also looking after others in the place of our mental health. Um, our mental health is actually our thoughts, feelings and emotions that impact on our functioning. And in a nutshell, if, you, if we can recognise that sometimes our mental health is positive, sometimes it's challenged and sometimes it gets to a point where it's really difficult to actually function. Before I begin my presentation, I'd firstly like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm presenting this on today, and in particular, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge anyone in the audience today that has lived experience of significant mental health challenges, because as Karen mentioned, it's actually a really difficult thing to think about at times and it can raise some pretty raw emotions. So please know that if anything today impacts you, that the most important thing is to access some services and some support um, today and any other day. 
I'm going to share some slides with you today that I think are absolutely the key elements to mental health and well-being uh, for all of us. The first thing I want to think about with you is that this is us. We're on a roller coaster. This is our life. Sometimes we hit that pit of the roller coaster that's just really great and it feels fantastic. Other times we hold on with absolute fear with what's around the corner. And sometimes we don't even know what's around the corner. But when, when I put my mental health hat on and my inclusion and diversity hat on, what we need to know is that we're not alone on this roller coaster and we can find comfort in that every single day. Uh, when we think about mental health, a really great way to look at it is on this mental health continuum and to shine a light on inclusion and diversity within mental health, this really sums it up that we make a choice to include people. We make a choice to include others in our lives and in particular at work. Uh, we make that choice by understanding diversity. And if we think about mental health, it really is diversity at its best. Every single person has a, is in a different place on this continuum. Some people are thriving and have positive emotions that bring them positive mental health. Many people within the middle of this continuum is ma many of us in our, in our community actually have what we know as uh, mental health challenges that actually impact our day-to-day -day functioning. And we also know it's very common for people to be diagnosed with a mental health condition. And we also need to recognise that the crisis moment, the point where many people can get to uh, without really recognising their challenges or not having anyone else to actually reach out to can be suicidal ideation. So that crisis point, that crisis moment is why we need to do all this work and discussion and acceptance of everybody's situation to avoid those that crisis point. Uh, much of what I do day to day is actually supporting workplaces to be mentally healthy. And there are three key aspects to a mentally healthy workplace. And we can include that diverse nature of absolutely everybody within a workplace. First of all, promoting information about mental health, encouraging that really natural and genuine and non-judgmental conversation. We also like to encourage many workplaces to take part in education programs, which I know the fabulous Dow team have, have begun to do, and they are just amazing people. Um, I truly can say through the promotional um, aspects of the education sessions that I've been, I have the privilege of um, instructing, I can absolutely feel a strong human element to the employees at Dow. So you need to know this. You need to know you're in a culture and, a, and a, a network of employees and trusted colleagues that are there to support you. We also know that including um, many people in that aspect of uh, it, it's going protecting them from workplace factors that can actually impact mental health. And we don't want people to come to work and leave work in a worse state of mental health challenge because of a lack of inclusion, diversity or acceptance of the challenges they have. And most of all, uh, with the very talented and experienced team at Dow to know that there are systems in place to address every single person that is reaching out for support, um, yeah, because of, because of their mental health challenge in itself. So they're really the three key aspects. And if we shine a light on inclusion and diversity, it really does blend perfectly together. What I want to reach out and say is there's two elements to our mental health. One is our own individual journey and the support we can give ourselves. The other comes with reaching out to others or allowing others to reach out to us. So this is a self-care plan that in one of my sessions at Dow, we worked really hard on developing our own individual self-care plans. What I'm going to do is take you through um, is take you through some of these aspects of self-care. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to think about which ones you're doing well. So as I talk about them, have a little think about 
which ones you might need to maybe step up a little bit. So this is our own individual mental health. The first one is about acknowledging your awareness of you and which emotions are sitting with you, what's impacting your day-to-day function and what's maybe potentially limiting you being at your best, what's challenging you. The second one is taking time every single day to care for your physical health because our exercise, eating and, um, and sleep have a direct impact on our mental health. Professional support, so knowing exactly where to go to access help. And we highly encourage accessing your EAP service or your local GP to begin a journey of support. It's also about day-to-day setting some goals for yourself, achieving, um, having some pride in what you do every day. That's a part of that professional support also. Our emotional self-care That really clumps together things like gratitude, empathy and being mindful um, and learning about these things, not just knowing about them, but actually practising them and doing them. So reaching out to others to support them, uh, being grateful for what you have every single day and actually making it a daily habit to do so. Our human spirit self-care is absolutely all about Um, taking that time and reflecting and relaxing. So this is permission to actually take time each day out of your day to just calm your soul. It might be that you have a hobby that you enjoy or just choose to go for a nice walk, enjoy nature, just something for you. The social aspect of self-care, that's all about staying social with your friends and this is actually a difficult time with our COVID pandemic. This is what's impacting many of us um, and challenging our mental health because we don't have that social outlet that we're used to. But we can get creative. We can do these chats over, um, in the virtual world. We can have phone calls. Um, these types of things are really important. So I'd like you to have a little bit of a think right now about which one, which two of these Um, and pop it into your Mentimeter, if we could, of those six aspects I spoke about, which two do you think you might need to step it up a little bit in? Um, We can probably analyse ourselves at this stage and our own care we're taking for our own mental health. Which two do you need to step up? We're going to look into these um, answers and it'll be really interesting to see the percentage of who needs to do what at the end of this session. Okay, so today is Are You OK Day, hence my groovy T-shirt. Um, Are You OK Day is a not-for-profit prevent, um, suicide prevention organisation that was founded here in Australia by a fabulous Australian by the name of Gavin Larkin in 2009. Um, Gavin unfortunately lost his father to suicide and he recognised the impact that not even asking someone if they're OK could potentially have and the impact that if you do ask it could potentially save a life. Unfortunately, two years afterwards, Gavin lost a a very strong battle with cancer and passed away. But his legacy here in Australia and even across the world lives on uh, with this day of recognition. But what we need to know is that today is the day we shout it out loud. But are you okay, Jay, should be every day. Are you okay day should be checking in on everybody. It should be checking in, asking the question, but listening for the answer. And if someone's not okay, support them on their journey to attempt to potentially be well. We know that suicide rates in Australia particularly um, are really quite dire. And we need to talk about this. We need to put it out as a community issue that we need to work as a strong community to improve these suicide rates. In particular, we need to shout out very loudly um, for the males in our community to step up and talk about how they're feeling. We absolutely know that a high percentage of suicides each year are males. Um, We can't put it any clearer than that, other than the fact that there is so much that we can do early on in the journey to potentially, um, you know, stop these crisis moments occurring. 
Now, if we look on this uh, slide here, it's a very interesting fact to consider that suicide protective factors are actually very similar to the self-care plan that we've already looked at. So things like having a supportive social network around us, having a positive purpose within our day to actually challenge us to just achieve something, living a healthy lifestyle, uh, relaxing and taking time to just calm that energy that we have. Uh, emotion management is a big part of mental health and this is really arming yourself with tools on how to actually navigate some difficult emotions, things like fear and sadness and guilt and anger. They're, they're actually tricky emotions that sit with us as humans. But we can work really hard with understanding and education and awareness on how to manage some of these emotions. Emotions, there's no such thing as a good, bad or ugly emotion. They are all there. We are humans. Without difficult emotions, we wouldn't be human. So accepting um, a little bit of self-acceptance, uh, self-compassion to know that not every day is going to be perfect, but if you can feel some of these emotions impacting on the way that you function and live your life, uh, that's the point we want people to access help. We also know that education and understanding and conversations and awareness about the topic of mental health is vital in our community. And I would encourage every single person within the Dow community to reach out and learn something new all the time about how to actually support yourself, but how to support, support others as well. Uh, having a source of income, um, we know is also a protective factor. So for many people around us, might be loved ones, family or friends that have lost their job due to the COVID pandemic, we need to keep an extra eye on these people and an extra are you okay question and non-judgmental listening for those fabulous people in our life. I'm going to show you a really short video now from the Are You OK Foundation. Um, it's a really to the point video that hopefully will make a bit more sense and then we'll have a little chat about how to ask the com and have the conversation of Are You OK for the video. Thank you. There's something we need to talk about. It's happening in Australia and will impact many of us. Suicide. An average of eight people die by suicide every day in Australia alone. For every death, it's estimated 30 people will attempt to take their life. And 89% of people report knowing someone who has attempted it. So why is this happening? Research shows that when these three factors combine, it increases someone's risk of suicide. One feeling isolated or disconnected from others. Two, the belief that they are a burden on others or society. And three, having the means to take their life. Are You OK is working to ensure everyone feels connected and is protected from suicide. We focus on reducing feelings of isolation and disconnection. But how do we do this? We all experience life's ups and downs and things like grief, relationship breakdown, financial difficulty, or losing a job. These moments can really challenge us. And sadly, many people feel they don't have anyone to confide in, but there is something that can help. You. Are You OK's impact is helping you make a difference to the people who are struggling with life. We do this by encouraging you to invest more time in the people around you, because when our relationships are strong, we're more likely to see those signs that someone's struggling. And when you see those signs, notice changes, or just feel that something's not quite right with your friend, colleague, loved one, teammate or neighbour, we want you to trust that gut instinct, reach out to them and ask, are you okay? You don't have to wait until they're in crisis. The earlier you reach out, the better the result. We know it can sometimes feel uncomfortable, especially if the person answers, no, I'm not okay, and that's okay but you can make a difference if you follow Are You OK's four conversation steps. One, ask, are you OK? Two, listen. Three, encourage action. And four, check in. By making time to look out for those around you, you can help people feel connected and help them access appropriate support 
long before they think about suicide. If we all meaningfully connect with those who may be struggling with life, we can increase people's sense of belonging and create a world where we're all connected and are protected from suicide. Ask, are you okay? And start a conversation that could change a life. Okay, so that's a really important message from Are You OK Day. Um, we want to, if I could have the next slide up, please, that would be great. Yep. So the first, the first um, question we ask is, are you OK? Trust your gut. Humans have very, very good gut instincts. Trust your gut. Ask the question, but listen for the answer. Uh, we listen without judgment and we listen and we ask questions that are appropriate. We actually ask open questions about this person's feelings and emotions, not particularly ours at that point. Make it about this person that you're supporting. We, we ask if there's anything we can do to help that person. And we also, we encourage the fact that this is a really common way to feel. Encouraging action early on in the process of uh, supporting someone, not waiting for that person to be in crisis is the biggest message of Are You OK Day. Encourage that action to speak out to a friend, a colleague, even a manager in a workplace. It might be that the workplace itself could support that person. We absolutely know that accessing professional services like the EAP service or a GP is vital also. We also want to just not leave it there. We want to follow up with the person that you're checking in on. So maybe even the next day, the next week, couple of weeks after, just checking in, not nagging or guilting the person, but actually just saying, I'm still here for you. I'm still here to support you. So Are You OK Day's message is loud and clear. It's all about asking. It's about listening without judgment. It's, it's most definitely encourage action to seek help because seeking help can get someone on a path to being well again and to manage those challenges in life. Um, if you come up to a point, which potentially you may, where someone says, I'm fine, I don't want help, that's what we call denial and it's actually a very common thing because many, many times people um, who are unwell with mental health challenges are the last person to realise they're unwell. They need a trusted friend, family member or colleague to have this open conversation to get them on the track. Uh, so reaching out, doing the very best we can to support ourselves and our mental health reaching out to support others with their mental health and their journey of support, but most definitely shining a light today on that inclusion that we are all a diverse group of humans. Um, and within your workplace, there are many people with many different challenges. So just accept um, people for who they are and include them to make your life at, uh, at work as comfortable as you can for yourself, but also for others. Um, before we finish up, let's have a little look at our Mentimeter results. I'm really interested to see which self-care um, aspects people are thinking they may just need to do a little bit more work on. We could have those results, please. That's really interesting. And I'm not surprised that the social element is topping the scale because right now we're limited. But that's a really good thing to know that that's an important part of our life going forward. Physical side, and I imagine there's a lot of people thinking, yeah, I need to work on my sleep. Um, absolutely. And getting out and about in this beautiful fresh air. And the human spirit, um, take time out of your day, permission to relax. Don't arm yourself with tasks all, all day and um, take that time. I'm actually really pleased um, to see here that most people, a very small percentage, but most people recognise how to access that professional support. So that's really encouraging. So thank you so much for listening today and I wish all my Dow um, friends and um, you know colleagues that I've met during my sessions at Dow uh, there is a really strong human element within your organisation and I wish you well. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. That was... Uh, Thanks, Karen. 
very yeah really made us um stop and think um about those around us and uh, a really helpful framework that we can all use to uh, be more courageous um, and more engaging yeah. those around us. Um, thanks to everybody for the questions that you submitted. We, we do have some questions for you, Kate. And um, so I might work through a few of those and give you the opportunity sure. to comment. Um, <laughs> The first one is, how do you know when you may need to access professional help for your mental health? Good question. And it's one that I get asked regularly, Karen. Um, when I spoke earlier about the impact on functioning, I'm talking about day-to-day -day impact. So things like sleeping, not having being able to navigate positive relationships, not being able to concentrate and uh, put time and effort and understanding into your tasks at work. So, so the time to access that help is when day-to-day -day functioning, like those things I just mentioned, are becoming just that little bit more difficult. It's what we call day-to-day -day challenges. Thank you. Um, another question what what is the most common mental health condition okay so the most commonly diagnosed mental health condition right now in australia is an anxiety disorders so 14 percent of australians currently have a diagnosed anxiety disorder so this is where uh, a fear of some sort which is actually what drives anxious feelings there's always some some type of fear sitting there uh, this gets to a point where the anxious feeling is either really, really is there at a heightened extent or it's there often and for a, a longer time. So it's all about the impact on functioning because we can have anxious feelings. That's part of being a human. But if it's impacting on your functioning, that's the point we really want people to know it's important to access some help. The two other most common um, depressive disorders, so depression and bipolar, are about 6% of our population diagnosed and substance use disorder is approximately 5%. So that's where the use of a substance is potentially impacting on functioning also. Thank you. Um, a question here that I think all of us with families, um, which is all of us of course, um, yeah. around children. Right. Younger children, especially, someone has asked, you know, often younger children don't listen to their parents. Um, and <laughs> yeah. this uh, person is a big advocate of monkey see, monkey do approach. So what would you consider to be the best approach to helping our kids apply mental health self-care in their lives? Yeah, so exactly the same as adults. And I've had a lot of experience in that adolescent space, supporting young people with crisis mental health counselling. Um, it's the same self-care plan. It's exactly those things we looked at, those six elements of self-care. And what it is, it's, it's talking about it to young people that we're doing this because it's really important for our health. Um, what we also need to really rest is to panic when they have emotions um, and not and for parents not to panic when young people have emotions it's all about managing that emotion and working through it if we can teach young people to actually verbalize how they're feeling and maybe even to navigate together as a family a plan forward to regulate these emotions and support them and find ways to improve those emotions uh, that's really the key element, is that self-awareness of, of mental health. Thanks, thanks. Um, a question actually about the workplace. Um, yep. Should I pass on the information to a manager if a colleague tells me about their struggles? Okay, that's a really important question. And the answer is you need to have consent from someone that shared their story or their struggle with uh, their mental health with you. Um, and the best approach is probably to say, would you like me to support you to speak to our manager or a manager? You can't go and tell, you know, privacy wise, you can't go and actually tell um, everybody within a, a network or um, even within your workplace what's going on. 
Um, there's a privacy issue there in a workplace and there's laws that govern this. But the, the situation changes if you feel that someone is unsafe. So consent goes out the window. We need to be transparent and honest and say to that person that if they are displaying or discussing suicidal ideation, that you need to pass that information on and keep them safe. My rule of thumb is if you believe someone is suicidal, we need to treat that as a medical emergency and keep them physically safe as best we can. So in a nutshell, the answer is don't share unless you have consent. Encourage them to reach out for help. But if it's a safety issue, you share. Thank you, Kate. That's actually really important advice. Um, look, one final question to wrap up your session, Kate, and that is um, if you could pick the most important aspect of the self-care plan to complete on a daily basis, what would it be? I Well, I really think back to that self-awareness. I think that is the key element to actually just take time every single day to sit and reflect on how you're feeling, to think which emotion is sitting with me today. And through difficult times in life, like our COVID times, that emotion's going to change. And it's almost playing a game with yourself to recognise which emotion is it and how can I navigate this to improve the way I'm feeling. Almost a plan of attack, really, for yourself um, and with the support of others around you. So self-awareness is the one for me. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, really, really grateful for everything that you've shared and, um, yeah, your, your great way of answering our questions. Thank you. So, Thank you so um, much for having me. <laughs> so I'd now like to introduce Wayne, Wayne Schwoss. Um, as I mentioned, Wayne heads up the enterprise Pucker Up. Um, I'm sure Wayne will give you a little bit more background about um, that organisation and his journey um, around mental health and well-being. Um, before I hand over to Wayne, I'd just like to remind everybody, um, please keep your questions coming either by text or email to Rebecca. And, and um, Wayne will also, uh, during the course of his talk, uh, invite you all to participate in another mentee poll. Thanks very much, Karen. Um, really appreciate the opportunity uh, to join everybody on an important day today, Are You OK Day? Um, firstly, I'd like to just acknowledge and thank Karen and the organising team from Dow for the invitation to engage with you today on a really important topic. Um, and also importantly, acknowledge Kate's uh, presentation. I've worked in this space for a very long time, which I'll give you a quick overview very shortly. But um, I think what Kate shared again today was very practical. And there's a number of different great takeaways there, um, even for somebody who's worked in this space for a long time. Um, which I think can help us begin to look after our mental health, but also be in a position without being expected to be the expert, to be able to support somebody that we care about, we love, or we, we may work with. So thanks very much for your share, Kate. Um, I think importantly, uh, there's a lot of focus on the significance and the importance of today. It's uh, World Suicide Prevention Day. It's Are You OK Day? Um, but I think it's also important to understand, to extend a little bit on what Kate was sharing with you this morning, is that are you okay that is something that I think we all can facilitate every day of every week throughout the course of any year. The thing about mental health conditions for a lot of people is that people that are living with these conditions don't pick and choose what day they live with them. So today is a great day to start these conversations. Uh, but I really want to encourage you, if you're concerned or worried about somebody within your network, be prepared to consistently open up discussions to encourage and invite that person in to begin to talk about whatever it is that they are comfortable talking with you about in the hope that you can start to facilitate um, a pathway for that person that you're concerned about to get the appropriate help and support that they need. 
Um, a, a little bit of background uh, for those who may not know uh, me and, and, and my story. I played AFL football for 14 and a half years with the Sydney Swans and the North Melbourne Football Club. Um, after 98 games, into my fifth year of uh, my 14 and a half year career, I was diagnosed with depression, the 9th of August 1993. And since that time, I've been on this uh, somewhat challenging, but also some uh, amazing journey of self-discovery to understand these conditions. Uh, and importantly, learn a lot about myself, which allows me to be able to proactively take care of my mental health and emotional well-being. I am on a 26-year mental health journey, and the reality is that I will be on that journey for the rest of my life, and I'm really comfortable with that. Um, I've lived with anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder. I live with those conditions privately and silently for the remaining 184 games of my career. I hid my conditions for 12 years from family, from friends, from teammates, from coaches, from everybody, basketball people, uh, my wife, two doctors, and a psychiatrist. And the reason I chose to make those decisions was because of fear and shame. I believe um, incorrectly that if people knew what I lived with, they would judge me, see me as weak, lose respect for me, I'd lose those relationships. And uh, the most concerning issue for me during that time was I thought that I would lose my career. Um, so I, I just have a lived experience and I work every day, uh, similar to Kate, believing in the importance and value of these conversations. So what I'd like to be able to engage you on today is um, I would like to be able to engage you, and, and I'm hoping that everybody can hear me okay. Um, I'd like to be able to engage you in a really important discussion um, uh, around why I believe that your mental health and emotional well-being is fundamentally important. And I think to begin that conversation, picking up on the, the key theme um, from a DAO perspective, Diversity and inclusion is important. We've done a tremendous amount of work um, in order to uh, change the expectations, not only within the broader community, but also within organisations. And this gives me great courage that Dow's doing a tremendous amount of work and has done and will continue to do a lot of work in regards to diversity and inclusion because race, religion, sexuality, um, uh, beliefs, all of these important characteristics uh, I'm really apologetic for the technical challenges. I'm hoping that people could understand and more importantly, hear what I'm actually saying. So if I could get an indication from somebody that you can actually hear what I'm saying, that, that, would, be, that would be a great sign. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so I was saying before, before um, I had the issues with uh, the technical side of things, is diversity inclusion is really important for a lot of reasons. But working in the mental health space, diversity inclusion for people living with legitimate mental health conditions, which can be anxiety related, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, social anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, bulimia, anorexia. Um, there's a whole host of mental health conditions that I'm sure a lot of you are already aware of. People that live with these, inclusion, uh, these conditions um, deserve the opportunity of being included, not excluded, not judged, not ridiculed, not labelled, not marginalised um, because of a legitimate set of medical conditions. And this is why I have great confidence that organisations like Dow are working incredibly hard to create inclusive, diverse environments for people with any and all um, personal challenges or conditions or issues that they are working with to come to work, to feel connected, to participate in a, in a, in a place of employment and to be respected and accepted um, for whatever challenges they might be experiencing. And this is really important because stigma exists within a great country like Australia. And stigma is the emotional outcome to discrimination. And this is why diversity and inclusion is really important. Because if we can accept and respect people that live with mental health conditions, we are actually eliminating stigma. And stigma is a totally unacceptable outcome. People that live with these conditions are just as worthy and just as deserving. And this is why I think that organisations like Dow um, are, are doing some really important work to ensure that people are given every opportunity to be able to fulfil their professional and also their personal goals. So I really want to acknowledge Dow as an organisation because sadly, not every organisation has the same attitude or level of commitment with regards to what we're talking about today. I'm going to spend the remainder of my session engaging you in a really important discussion 
I've been working in this space for a very long time. If I'm the only person engaging in the conversation, then the reality of that is it's one person talking at or to a group of people. I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is giving you the opportunity, inviting you in to participate using the chat function. Now, I will ask some really simple questions. And the reason why I ask these simple questions is twofold. Number one, I want to be able to illustrate through the discussion and conversation that we have for the next 30 minutes that these conversations aren't as difficult to have as what we sometimes think that they are. And secondly, I believe that if I can engage you into the conversation, I can give you more practical and actionable strategies that allow you to take those things away or some of those things or one of those things away and give you an opportunity of reflecting and questioning and working out whether or not something that we share has value and benefit to you. And the reason why I think that this is really important is because every person on this call has well-being. And what I want to encourage you to start thinking about, if you haven't yet started to think about it, is that well-being applies to 100% of the population. But the default position for a lot of us in the community, and this is not a criticism, is that when we think about mental health, we think about mental health conditions. Anxiety, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, and, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, the common mental health conditions. And those answers are true, but that's at one end of the wellbeing spectrum. Wellbeing is also somebody who might be stressed but doesn't exhibit or have the early signs of a mental health condition from manifesting. It's still wellbeing, but you're at a different position on the wellbeing spectrum. And then you might have people on the call today who are up the other end of the wellbeing spectrum, people that are coping really well, both physically, mentally and emotionally. And that's a great position to be in. Through my own personal experience and working in this sector for a long period of time, and this is not to be interpreted as being critical, what consistently happens from an individual perspective is we wait until we become overwhelmed, we become incredibly stressed, or we slip into this crisis space. And an outcome of crisis is where people start to think about harming themselves or they do harm themselves. I do not believe as an individual, but also as a professional running pucker up, that anybody needs to become unwell or sick before we start to think about our mental health and emotional well-being. So I want to encourage you to start to think about where am I on the well-being spectrum? Am I somebody who's coping really well? Fantastic. What can I continue to do to keep me coping really well, physically, mentally and emotionally? Am I somebody who is stressed? I don't necessarily think I have the early signs of a mental health condition. But what can I do today to minimise or eliminate the stress that I'm dealing with or experiencing and work back to a position of well-being? And also, there may be people on this call today who have or who are living with mental health conditions. What can you do today and into the future that helps you begin to slowly move back to a position of being healthy and well, physically, mentally and emotionally? I was someone for 12 and a half years who never thought that I'd be healthy never thought that I'd be happy, never thought that I'd be in control of my life. I'm pleased to say through this experience that I have not only got control back of my life, I'm happy, I'm healthy. I, like a lot of people, am navigating my way through a really challenging COVID experience. But what's helping me get through these challenging times that we're all living through is a toolbox which I've developed over a long period of time, which allows me to make proactive decisions, decisions that have a positive and a preventative impact on my mental health and emotional well-being. Now, it took me 12 years before I found the courage to tell people what I was living with. I don't want people to wait 12 days, let alone 12 hours. If you're not feeling like you're coping, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling agitated, if you're feeling sad, it's okay to feel those experiences. What I don't want you to do is make the decisions that I made. Because the sooner we put our hand out for help, the sooner we find the courage to ask for help, the sooner we start that journey of seeking professional help and taking care of our mental health and emotional well-being, we can start to eventually work back to a position of well-being and develop the tools that you can take with you into every area of your life. So I'm going to ask a series of simple questions. And the questions are not to um, patronise anybody. It's not to make anybody feel uncomfortable, embarrassed. It's not about decisions that you have made or you haven't made. It's not about any of that. The whole purpose of the questions is to start to get you to think about health in relation to two really important parts of the health equation. Because for more than 15 years, 99.9% .9 of the audiences that I've engaged with invest into one area of health. And conservatively, less than 20% of the same audiences 
are investing into the other area of the health equation. My job today is to help us make that connection if we haven't already, because they're not mutually exclusive. They are reliant on one another. So the questions are designed in a way to help you start to think about and reflect on what am I doing with my physical health? What am I doing or what, I, what, I haven't, what haven't I been doing in regards to my mental health? So I'm going to ask a, 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 an opening question. And the question is, with a one word answer, and I'm, I'm more than happy for everybody to, to get involved in this, I'd like to understand what has been a motivating reason as to why at some point in the past or currently you have decided to invest into your physical health. All you need to do is answer in the chat function. I'll be able to scan a number of the reasons or the, uh, the answers. There's no right or wrong reasons uh, here. Um, these are just to help me understand as to why you have consciously decided to invest into your physical health. It could be to lose weight, it could be to get fitter, it could be to be a better parent, it could be to be a better partner, husband, wife, whatever it may be. It doesn't matter what the answers are. The answers are relevant to you, and thank you, Rebecca, for long-term health, less stressed at work, less stressed in life. These are, these are, these are relevant answers to maintain physical fitness. Um, these, the, these are important because we all have motivating reasons as to why we feel it's important to be able to invest or to invest into our physical health. To reach wealth, I'm not 100% what that answer to uh, might, might be. Um, a sense of achievement, absolutely. Keep the answers coming in. I'm really comfortable. I want you to participate in this conversation because the more times we are prepared to have these open and honest conversations, two things happen. One, we give ourselves permission to talk about these important topics. But secondly, we actually help normalise mental health and emotional wellbeing. That's really important because the more we can normalise it, it means that over time, when we look at health, it's a combination of physical and mental. It's not physical here and mental health over here. We need to be able to bring mental health and physical health together under the same banner of health. Improving relationships, be strong for my family, live longer, motivating others, be there for our kids, less anxiety to find happiness. These are all fantastic and really important, relevant answers for, for the people that have shared them. And thank you for doing that. The reason I ask these uh, questions is because every human being, whether you're female or male, there is intrinsic personal value and importance on our physical health for the reasons that you've shared and many more. Our physical health is important to us to do all the things that we want to do, to feel all of the obligations and relationships that we have commitments to doing, to be better parents, partners, employees, managers, friends, family, all of those things. So there's value and importance that we place on our physical health. But then what we also do as human beings, we put more value and more uh, importance and more priority on our physical health when we're unwell physically. And I want to illustrate that. Again, this is not a patronising question, but without knowing anyone's story here, I am absolutely confident that every person on this call has done what I'm about to ask what we do when we're not well physically. And what I mean by this is we, we invest into our physical health because it's important to us. But then what we do is we put more value, more importance and more priority on our physical health when we're unwell physically because we've made a conscious decision at some point up in the past to identify something within ourselves without knowing what the underlying issue is and then making a connection by going and seeing someone. So can I ask the individual participants in the audience. When you've been unwell physically, and it may have been migraines, headaches, vomiting, temperature, aches and pains, you may not have been able to eat food, you may not have been able to get out of bed, clearly you were physically unwell, unable to go to work, unable to do anything. There's one consistent professional that we have all gone to get their professional support when we've been unwell physically. Who do you think that might be? And again, I'm not trying to patronise anybody. I'm illustrating the point, the difference and sometimes disconnection that we have when it becomes a physical health or a mental health challenge that we're living with. So the question is, every woman and every man 
with a level of confidence. When you've been unwell physically before, you have made a decision to prioritise your physical health by going and seeing someone to get some support. Who do you think that might be? And it should be a pretty easy answer. Thank you. There we go, a GP. I'm going to assume here that everybody on this call at some point in their past has recognised that they are unwell physically and then they have made the decision, I need to go and see a GP. Of course we do, because it makes sense. But I can confidently say that there, with, unless there's a doctor on this call, to diagnose the underlying health issue. But what we all have, and I see this consistently every time I engage with audiences, we're not the experts. We can't diagnose the underlying health issue. We can't write ourselves a treatment plan. We can't give ourselves medication if we need it. We don't know how to deal with the issue. We don't have that expertise or knowledge. But what every single woman and man does have is a level of self-awareness and a capacity to listen to the signals that the body is sending us. This is really important because we already have this level of self-awareness and a capacity to notice temperature, vomiting, diarrhea, aches and pains, migraines, headaches, whatever. We don't know the underlying health issue, but we have enough knowledge to identify that our physical body is sending us a signal it will get to a point where we go, this is serious. I need now to put more value, priority and importance on my physical health because it's deteriorating. And the way that we do that is we pick up the phone and we make an appointment to see the GP because we know they can help us with the issue. Diagnose the underlying health issue. What's the treatment plan? What's my part or your part in executing the treatment plan? And how long before I start to feel better? We understand that. We also understand that investing into our physical health there's three overriding reasons, consistent reasons as to why people invest into their physical health above and beyond the answers that you've already shared today. And what I'd like to do is invite you in to answer these questions. Why do we invest? What are we trying to prevent when we invest into our physical health? I'm not talking about getting fitter. I'm not talking about being better versions of ourselves or being there for our kids or our partners. They're all important. But there's three overriding reasons why we invest into our physical health and we invest into our physical health because we are we are we are trying to prevent certain things from happening we've already had one of the answers with the opening question that i asked so i'll give you a, a few seconds to send your answers through and continue to participate in this because this is really valuable i get as much enjoyment out of this as you do hopefully what are we trying to prevent when we invest into our physical health we are trying to prevent three important things from happening in relation to our physical health. Number one, and I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to uh, contribute to this, we are trying to invest into our uh, physical health and prevent ourselves from dying any sooner than we have to. We all want to live a long life with a quality of health. So we invest into our physical health for the reasons that we've shared, but we're also investing into our physical health to give ourselves the greatest opportunity of being as healthy as we possibly can for as long as we can. No one wants to die any sooner than we have to, to prevent an early death, there we go. But there's two other really important reasons why we invest into our physical health from a preventative space. Trying to live longer and pain-free, yep. Absolutely. But we're also trying to prevent ourselves from breaking down and getting sick. So the consistent theme with all audiences is we invest into our physical health because there has an immediate benefit, but we're also trying to prevent ourselves from breaking down, getting sick or dying any sooner than we have to. This is consistent. So let's park that physical health piece of the conversation and please continue to invest and prioritise your physical health. Can I get an indication just with a simple why or a yes? Who owns a car or a motorbike? And if you own a car or a motorbike, have you invested into servicing your vehicle or motorbike that you currently own? Again, there's no right or wrong answers here. It's not about embarrassing anybody. I'm just trying to help us think about this. Because the reason I ask the, the, the question about our mode of transport is that what I've learned and observed over a long period of time is that we apply similar strategies and applications to our physical health, to the health of our vehicles or our motorbikes. So what this proves to me is that we place value and importance on the health and well-being of our cars or our motorbikes. 
Now, if I'm to ask a question here in regards to why we invest into servicing our vehicles or our motorbikes, there we go, I've already got an answer. We invest into our vehicles or our motorbikes because we, we don't want them to fall apart. We don't want them to break down. We don't want them to get sick. We want to keep them running reliably, dependably, safely. The performance, our safety, every time we use a car or a motorbike is really important. So we understand that there's value and importance in servicing preventatively to maintain the health and well-being of our cars and our, our motorbikes. We also know, I'm assuming here, that if our car or motorbike was to break down on a major thoroughfare today and we couldn't get it going, we can ring roadside assistance because that's effectively the GP for the car. We can call them out, they can diagnose the issue, what's the treatment plan, what's the cost, can you get it going, can it get me home? Fantastic, let's go. We understand that the doctor, which is the mechanic, can keep our cars running, but also can uh, uh, attend to a problem if the car starts to break down, get sick, or it may, it may die on the side of a road. So we do apply similar strategies from a health and wellbeing maintenance perspective, but also a preventative perspective our physical health and the health of our cars. Fantastic. Because we understand there's value and importance of both of those examples, being healthy as well for as long as we possibly can. We don't ignore the early signs or symptoms of something going wrong, breaking down, getting sick, because we prioritise it by calling the doctor and going seeing them from a physical health perspective, or we call the mechanic and taking our car or motorbike to see them. So great, keep that going. Now I'm going to ask a question which will take a level of authenticity and honesty. The definition of pucker up, which is my organisation, which I founded three and a half years ago, is authentic and genuine. It's really important to me at a personal level because authentic and genuine, said another way, open and honest, are the two most important values that I live my life by. Because for 12 and a half years I was neither. I hid my conditions because of fear and shame. I choose no longer to do that and make those decisions. Instead, I choose to be authentic and genuine, open and honest about my mental health and emotional well-being, because it puts me in charge of decisions that I can make on a daily basis to remain healthy and well mentally and emotionally. But it's also a message that I want to encourage you to start to think about. Are you being open and honest, authentic and genuine about your own mental health and emotional well-being? Because if you're not, then it potentially has the ability or the, or the opportunity of making our experiences harder and more challenging. So the question that I'm going to ask you, again, this is not about right or wrong. It's not about decisions that you've made, decisions that you haven't made. It's not about embarrassing you. It's not about making people feel uncomfortable. The whole purpose of this next question is to hopefully allow you to think about your mental health and emotional wellbeing. I don't know anybody. But what I do know is your mental health and emotional well-being is important to every area of your life. My job today is just to help you make that connection. When we think about health, it's the combination of physical plus mental. If we want to live a long life with a quality of health, not break down, not get sick and not die sooner than we, than we want to or we need to, then it's not just reliant on physical health. If you would like to give yourself the best opportunity of achieving the ultimate goal of a long life with a quality of health, it's physical plus mental. It's physical plus emotional. They're not mutually exclusive. They rely on one another. You can be physically fit like I was through my AFL career, but mentally you can be incredibly unwell and it's simply not worth that. If you're mentally unwell, if your mental health is being negatively impacted, it will manifest itself physically. So if it makes perfect sense to service our vehicle, which sometimes includes tuning up the motor, so it doesn't impact the physical performance of the car, then it makes perfect sense if our body and our brains is our vehicle. This is our carriage and our motor sits right here. If it makes sense to tune up our motor in our vehicle or our motorbike to make sure it runs properly as often as it possibly can, then it makes perfect sense to me that we start to tune up our brain, our emotions, our thoughts and our feelings so that physically and emotionally we're running as well as we can for as long as we possibly can. So the question I'd like to invite you to answer, and this will take a level of honesty from you, and hopefully you feel like it's a safe space for you to participate in this discussion. And if you answer no to this question, you haven't done anything wrong. And I'll talk to those people who hopefully answer that question honestly shortly. I would like to invite you to answer with a simple yes or no. This question. Are you investing similar amounts of time, money and effort 
that you have and you will continue into your physical health, that you have and you will continue into the health and well-being of your car or motorbike, into your mental health. Are you investing the same or similar amounts of time, money and effort into your mental health, like the health of your vehicle or motorbike and your physical health? And please remember, this is not about right or wrong. This is not about embarrassing you. This is not about making you feel uncomfortable. This is just about an important conversation. And to those people who have already answered no, thank you. Sometimes that answer can be challenging and a little bit confronting. It's okay. Because we can't change what we've done in the past. And to be honest with you, with all due respect to everybody on the call, I'm not interested in in the influencer. What I'm interested in is what can we do today and what can I give you so you can start to make different decisions moving forward. And with the answers, and please keep the answers to that particular question coming through because it gives me an understanding of um, the responses of people. And there are a lot of no's. Thank you for being willing to answer the question honestly. I really appreciate that takes a level of authenticity and courage. I quickly just want to acknowledge the people that have said yes, they are investing into their mental health and emotional wellbeing. Whatever your motivating reasons were, I admire you and encourage you to continue to invest into your mental health and emotional wellbeing for the rest of your life. Because you've made a decision where you've connected your physical and mental health, and that's encouraging, and I think it's really important. Find other things you can do to invest into your mental health and emotional wellbeing. Continue to develop your toolbox, which allows you to deal with stress, eliminate, minimise it, and work back to a position of being healthy and well, physically, mentally and emotionally. And the other thing that I would say to those people that have said, that have answered, they are starting their, they have started their mental health journey, and I, I'm unapologetic about this. Never, ever compromise your mental health and emotional wellbeing for anything or anyone. Never. Because in order to be a better husband or wife, in order to be the best parent you can be, the best brother or sister, auntie or uncle, girlfriend, mate, manager, employee, member of the community, your mental health is incredibly important to be able to fulfill all of those obligations. And I, I don't want anybody compromising or sacrificing their mental health and well-being for anything or anyone. And I live by that mantra. I've lost three relationships uh, over the last 15 years where I've, I've gone public with my journey. Two of those relationships are with immediate family, um, a parent and a sibling. I have not spoken to either of them for 12 years. That may sound harsh, but I've made a conscious decision to ensure that I have people that are understanding, non-judgmental, and, and uh, people that accept and respect me for who I am and what I live with and what I've gone through. I will not make compromises and allow people that are negative and destructive or toxic in my life to stay in my life. Because my mental health and emotional well-being is the number one priority. And that's something that I live by. That's a decision that I want to encourage you to think about. Um, ultimately, it's up to you as to whether or not you choose to do that. So keep doing or keep investing into your mental health. To everybody else that hasn't yet started their journey, today's a really important day because we can't go back and do things in the past. But what we can do is start to think about what we might choose to do moving forward. And this is why it's important. To everybody that has answered honestly that you haven't yet started investing into your mental health, I appreciate your honesty. I want to invite you uh, to think about doing a very simple, short exercise if you think that this is important to you. I'd like, you to, I'd like to invite you to do a simple five to 10 minute exercise. And what you need is a, a pen, a piece of paper or a pad, and you need a quiet space. No family, no children, no TV, gadgets, nothing. Just a quiet space. And, and what, what I want to encourage you to do is, if you're prepared to do this little exercise, I want to encourage you and challenge you to answer these four really important questions as honestly as you possibly can. Question number one, to the people that haven't yet started investing into their mental health and have, have not begun their, their wellbeing journey, the first question I want you to ask yourself, and I can't answer this for you, it's only, it's only up to you, it's up to you whether or not you're prepared to answer these questions really honestly. 
But I'm, I'm trying to help you understand that we are prioritizing something which does not categorically have the same amount of value, importance and priority than your mental health. And here's the opening question. If you haven't started investing into your mental health, yet you own a car or a motorbike, why are you valuing and putting more priority and importance on your vehicle or your motorbike and not on your mental health? If there is value and importance in servicing your motorbike or your vehicle, because you don't want it to get sick, you don't want it to break down, you don't want it to die, you want to maintain the health and well-being and performance, reliability, safety and dependability of our vehicles or our motorbikes, then why is your mental health not as important? There is not a plausible answer, and I can, I can, I can respect that we may have difference of opinions. I'm not telling you what to do, I'm just encouraging you to start to think about this. But I am yet to come across a plausible, acceptable reason why the health and well-being of a car or a motorbike is anywhere near more important than your mental health and emotional well-being. So if there's value and importance on servicing and preventatively looking after your car or motorbike, then it makes perfect sense to me that we start to approach and apply the same thing to our mental health and emotional well-being. Because if we don't want the car to break down, get sick or die, then we don't want the same for ourselves. That's the first question. The second question, why not? Why haven't I started my journey? The third question, what's holding me back? What are those barriers? What are the things that are in the way that are not allowing me to invest into my mental health and emotional wellbeing? What am I scared of? What am I fearful of? And to help you with that, what kept me in a position where I consciously chose for 12 years not to talk to anybody but my wife, two GPs and a psychologist about what I went through is because I lived with paralyzing fear every day for 12 years. I lived with shame, embarrassment, guilt. I saw myself as a failure. And I incorrectly believed that if I told people what I was living with, family, friends, teammates, coaches, supporters, sponsors, complete strangers, if I told them that I had mental health conditions, they judge me, see me asleep, weak, lose respect, I'd lose those relationships, and worst of all, I, was, I, I believed that I'd lose my career. They were my barriers, that was my fear. It was those things that kept me uh, away from investing into my mental health and emotional wellbeing. So what are yours? What's in the way? What's preventing you? Once we understand what they are, we can start to work towards removing them, getting them out of the way, eliminating, and then we've got a clear runway to start investing into our mental health and emotional wellbeing. And the fourth question, which is the most important question, what can I do? What can I do? What can I start to do that allows me to proactively and preventively invest into my mental health and emotional wellbeing? And I'm going to, I'm going to quickly share with you <clears throat> the things that I do. These are tools that I've been using for a very long time, and these are the tools that I use every day, especially since COVID has impacted our lives. This is my recipe. It works well for me. What works well for me not well, may not work well for you. I encourage you to experiment, to try to develop, find what works for you and put it in your toolbox. Because the tools that you develop through this experience are tools that you can take in any area of your life when stress starts to have an impact professionally or personally. Number one, feelings and emotions. I give myself permission to feel, to think and experience all of my emotions. I cried yesterday and I cried openly because my great mate Danny Frawley a year ago passed away tragically. I, as a 51 year old male, don't deny the fact that I'm an emotionally expressive and emotionally vulnerable human being. Do I think I'm weak? No, it's just part of being a human being. So I allow myself to experience happiness, joy, love, sadness, overwhelmed and crying. Really important through COVID that we give ourselves permission to reconnect emotionally and allow our thing, ourselves to experience, feel and think all of our emotions. We haven't done anything wrong. We're just having a human response to a challenging experience. Number two, I have a checklist. Allows me to audit my life when I'm feeling stressed. Am I working too much? Am I saying yes too often? What's my diet like? What am I sleeping like? Am I exercising? Am I communicating? And generally what happens when I'm feeling overwhelmed and really stressed, I've started to overlook or ignore those important characteristics and strategies that I need to continue to prioritize. Once I understand what I've overlooked or neglected, I can make decisions to address that. Number three, sleep, most important thing we can give ourselves. And if we're using alcohol to cope with the current situation, I'm not telling anyone what to do. Alcohol is a depressant. If our mood is lower and we drink alcohol, it goes, it goes lower. So think about our alcohol consumption. If you want better sleep, have a couple of nights where you don't drink or minimise the amount that you do drink. It's the most important thing we give ourselves. 
Diet is really important, what we eat and what we drink, but also what do we consume? What do we watch, read and listen by way of media? Is it having a negative impact on how you feel, your outlook on life, the way that you get through your day? If it's having a negative impact, park it, pause it or don't watch it, read it or listen to it. I closed down my Twitter account earlier this year with 26,000 followers. Why? It's toxic. I don't need that in my life. So I think consciously about what I eat, what I drink and what I consume. I want to encourage you to think about that too. Exercise, I'm a cyclist, I don't care what you do, I care that you exercise. The body benefits and responds incredibly well from a physiological perspective, physically, mentally and emotionally, self-worth, self-confidence, self-belief, self-value, when we exercise. Walk, run, swim, jog, bike ride, sit in the sun. Move our bodies. Communication and connection through difficult experiences is fundamentally important. I'm communicating with network all the time when I'm going well, when things are challenging, when I need their support. I'm not afraid of asking for help. I'm not afraid of talking to people. I'm not afraid of communicating. I don't necessarily need my network to fix the problem because they don't have the skill set or experience. I just share that with them because that lightens my load. My load. The final thing that I want to encourage you all to start thinking about is when we grow up, we are taught, conditioned and told to believe that when we get emotional and we cry in front of another person, we've done something wrong, we should have um, we should be able to keep all of that together we don't want to burden other people but this is this is a conditioning that we've all been conditioned to believe next time you get emotional and you feel overwhelmed and you feel like you're going to cry whether you're a woman or a man i don't care give yourself permission to cry and when you feel the urge to say sorry catch it before you say it swap it out with thank you we've been taught told and conditioned to believe that we need to apologize when we're adults and we cry that's not right being an emotionally expressive and connected human being is part of our journey. So if it's okay for young children to cry, then it's never been more important for adults to cry. And I'm a father of three kids who has made a lot of mistakes. But in my humble opinion, the greatest gift we can give our children through difficult experiences is the gift of seeing their parents vulnerable and emotional and expressing and communicating all of their emotions. Because what that does, it's important for us as human beings that we allow ourselves to experience those emotions and feelings, but it's also showcasing and illustrating to our children that being emotional and expressive is normal behaviour as a young child and as an adult. I love what I do. I love the work that I'm involved in. My experiences have been tough at times, but they've taught me so much about myself and they give me this opportunity of engaging with people and organisations such as Dow and each of you today. To those people in finishing that have begun their mental health journey, please continue it. And to those people who haven't yet begun their journey, then today, on the 10th of September 2020, September 2020 is a great day to start your wellbeing journey because your mental health and emotional wellbeing is absolutely important to everything you do. So thank you very much for being in this discussion. Wayne, thank you. Spoken with an incredible amount of passion. And we do have a final Mentimeter poll um, that relates to what we just heard from Wayne. So if you can all pick up your devices and answer the question, our first Mentimeter poll question, which is quite simple, very simple, are you ready this to take good. your, here we go, are you comfortable to start your well-being journey? So let, let's see. Um, choices, five, no, okay, yes, not sure, no. Now let's see how uh, people react to that question. Wayne. It's pretty good. It's pretty good, Karen. Yep. It's fantastic. I think people have heard you. That's an amazing outcome. Great right result. So please everyone keep keep your responses coming. And while you're doing that, Wayne, if you don't mind, um, we have had some questions come in through the text and the email line as well. Sure. Um Actually, they're coming quite thick and fast. 
So, uh, here we go. Sport personalities obviously have, uh, many of them have a very uh, public platform to do a lot of good and to have a lot of influence. But many times, unfortunately, we often see them apologising for poor behaviour. So um, who in the world of sport do you see as positive role models for our young people in regard to mental health, particularly at this challenging time? Well, there's a number of different people. Karen, um, Caitlin Thwaites, uh, Michael Slater, Ian Thorpe, uh, Libby Trickett, uh, Preston Campbell, Kyle Vanderkite, um, Nathan Thompson, Dale Thomas. There's a range of um, female and male athletes that have all spoken publicly about their own personal challenges with mental health conditions, um, which I think takes a level of courage and confidence uh, in order to speak openly and honestly. Tom Boyd, uh, Ling Jong, or a couple of other AFL players that come to mind. The, 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 I think unfairly what happens, not only in Australia, but globally, that athletes, elite athletes, are often held to a higher regard and put on a much higher pedestal than people that, politicians, prime ministers, premiers, etc., etc. And I think that's a heavy cross to bear sometimes. Um, and, and they're held to a higher account and sometimes the consequences of their mistakes and actions uh, seem somewhat um, severe and over the top sometimes, but this comes with the territory. But it's those people who have decided to speak openly and honestly about their own personal experiences with mental health that I admire greatly because not only does it allow them to own their story, which means they no longer become the prisoner of the experience, which is quite negative, they become the author of their future chapters. That's empowering. But I've seen firsthand, Karen, the profound ripple effect in the community every time a high profile person, athlete or otherwise, speaks openly about their personal experiences. It helps to normalise these important topics and conversations. But most importantly, it gives hope to thousands of thousands of people in the community who may be dealing with these conditions. Well, if it's good enough for that person to go and get help and start to talk about it, then it's it's OK for me. And I think this is the real value and importance of high profile people speaking openly and honestly. It helps them, but it has a profound impact in the broader community. And they're the people that I admire the most. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you. Often um, it would be nice to see the business of them a similarly high profile, actually, the ones that bring the positive um, influences to our lives. Um, another question that brings us back to, to the workplace, Wayne, um, what actions can we as individuals take to improve inclusion and diversity in our own workplaces? Yeah, I think this is a really important question, Karen, and I've reflected on this a lot. Uh, and I'm going to answer this from a personal perspective. If I choose to stay silent when I see, I hear or I witness someone being discriminated against, ridiculed, labelled, judged, made fun of, marginalised within a workplace because they have a legitimate mental health condition or they may be stressed or they may be emotional, if I stay silent on, uh, in regards to witnessing that type of behaviour, then I'm part of the problem. So the way that I would encourage people to start to think about what can we do to continue to work towards being a diverse and inclusive organisation and community is approach it in a similar sense to racism. Every time we call out discrimination and stigma, we're actually reinforcing what is no longer acceptable we're not tolerating it. It takes courage and strength to be able to do this. But if we don't do this, the incredibly negative impact at a personal level that that type of discrimination and stigma can and does have on the individual can be quite devastating and in sometimes can be tragic. So I would encourage people, how do we communicate? Is it supportive? Is it non-judgmental? Is it inclusive? Is it empathetic? Is it compassionate? What are we saying to ourselves and what are we saying to other people? But also when those moments arise where someone may say something which is flippant, it might be off the cuff, they may not think that it's negative, uh, it's judgmental, 
it's marginalising somebody, in a respectful manner, I would encourage people to step up and say, I don't think that's, a, I don't think that's appropriate. It's actually inappropriate. It's not being respectful. It's not being inclusive. So I'd like to encourage you to think about what you've said and what could you say differently. And again, it takes courage and strength to be able to do that. But I think we all have the same opportunity, irrespective of the business, the industry and the community and family that we live in. Because the reality is we will all know someone that we live with, work with or love who is living with these conditions. And we need to create an incredibly inclusive and supportive community so those people feel supported and have the strength to get the appropriate help that they deserve. Excellent, thank you. And certainly I think speaking out um, is a very strong theme within our own um, commitment to inclusion and diversity in the company as well, particularly around uh, racial discrimination or all kinds of discrimination. It does take courage. Um, all right, there's another question here, actually quite an interesting one, Wayne, that turns around uh, some of your comments around physical, mental and emotional well-being. Someone may be speaking from experience here. How would you suggest to encourage someone who has a recognised mental health condition and is actually getting help for that, but doesn't have the energy or the commitment to improve their physical health and well-being? Yeah, this is this is a, probably one of the most common questions I, I, I get asked, Karen. I think it's a really relevant one. If I if I'm the way that I would answer that is picking up a number of things that Kate shared um, earlier today, and that is if we're a support person or in the support network of somebody who is being challenged or living with mental health conditions, they are or they may not be getting the appropriate help. Our job as a support person is not to fix the problem because we don't have the skill set and the experience or the expertise to be able to treat the underlying issue. That's not our that's not our job. That's not our function. The primary role of someone who is a support person to another person going through some challenging experiences is to listen. That's that came through with Kate's um, presentation this morning. Creating safe, supportive, non-judgmental opportunities and environments at home at work, at a sporting club, anywhere, where the person that we're concerned about understands through our consistent actions and behaviours that we care, we're there to listen. We, know, we may not have the solutions, we may not be able to solve it because we don't have that capability and we definitely won't judge them. Our job is to create opportunities in environments that allow the person that we care about to feel safe and supported to the point where they can talk to us about what it is that they are going through. Open-ended questions. How are you feeling? What would you like to do? How would you like me to support you? What would you need from me to help you through this experience? The, the way that we deliver questions is really important because if we, if we were to sit there and say, you're not working on your physical health, you know this is not good for you, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. What we're doing is we're taking away the opportunity from the person that we care about to own their own answers. We have no right of telling somebody what to do. That's not for us to make those decisions. So by being open and asking the person, what do you think? What do you want? What do you need? How can I help you? Please tell me. Gives the person that we care, we care about the opportunity to own their own answers. They have a level of ownership and control over the conversation. That's empowering, not disempowering. But it also shows through our behaviour that we're not trying to tell them what, them what to do. We're simply trying to show up consistently and show through our behaviours and our actions that we care, we're there to support them, they can trust us, and we will support them in whatever way that we can do through a difficult experience. Thank you, Wayne. One final question um, before we start to move to, to the uh, reflections and wrap up. Someone has asked, since you mentioned that you have stepped away from some people in your life, easier said than done, what strategies did you actually use to deal with those negative people in your life? 
uh, until at the, the, the time I made my decision to end those relationships, I was very tolerant. Um, you know, they, they, these are immediate family members uh, who are important to me in my life. Um, I have no animosity. I'm not angry. I'm not bitter. I want these people to have a happy and healthy life. But over an extended period of time, which was more than 10 years, I realised that these people were having a profoundly negative impact on my life. They weren't accepting, they weren't supportive, they weren't understanding, and they were incredibly negative. Um, I, I finally made a decision as hard as it was that I, this is not help, having a positive impact or a healthy impact on the way that I feel and live my life. And as tough as those decisions were to make, um, I'm glad that I made those decisions because I need to prioritise my mental health and emotional wellbeing. I'm responsible for my mental health, but I'm also responsible for uh, inviting and allowing people into my life. And I want people who are supportive, who are understanding, who don't judge me, who don't see me negatively, who don't bring negative conversations and contributions into my life. So I'm very selective and protective. My network is my network. I, I, I take great pride and comfort in carefully making sure that I surround myself with those people that absolutely support me in every regard. And that's been one of the most important yet difficult decisions that I've had to make. And that's why I encourage people to never, do not compromise your mental health and emotional wellbeing for anything or anyone. If people are having a negative impact on your mental health and emotional wellbeing, I want to encourage you, don't tolerate it because you're compromising your own health and wellbeing. Prioritise it and make some of those tough decisions. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Wayne, um, and also to Kate, uh, thank you for your sharing today. I think both, both of you are at the epitome of what it means to be authentic and genuine and obviously bring a lot of passion, expertise and experience to this topic. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time just by way of a wrap up to reflect on what we've heard today. And we've started to get some comments from those of you out there on your reflections of today's event. So please send more through um, to the text number or the email, just a brief comment on, on how you found the event or any key takeaways that you have or that you would like to share. Uh, whilst we're doing that, I would like to make a few acknowledgements. Um, if, firstly, all of you participating today, those of you who are DAO employees and our colleagues, friends, um, partners and customers, given up two, day, uh, two hours um, of your time today, we genuinely hope that you have found it helpful and meaningful um, and in some small ways can, can lead to some positive change. Um, the event uh, today, big thank you to our own Australia, New Zealand energy team, our combined all in, in, our, in our ERG chapter lead. So Rocky, Lamatina, Morella, Veronica, Anne Shields, uh, Sinyi, Timor, Elissa, Samsu, uh, and, and Rebecca, a big thank you to all of you uh, for the hard work uh, behind the scenes putting this event together. Thank you to Peanut Productions, um, a partner who has worked with us um, in the past on our live events and, and, and now supporting us on, on our virtual event today uh, to produce this uh, webinar. Michael and Sal, um, thank you, and the technical team behind the scenes. Thank you very much for producing the event today. Um, a particular shout out to Anne, Anne Shields, who is our um, workplace health and services nurse, who has brought so much professionalism um, to the job this year and, and shone a very strong and positive spotlight on mental health, <clears throat> even stretching way before COVID struck and has introduced us all to many great resources and, and awareness. So thank you again, big thank you to all of those. So uh, Wayne and Kate and, and everybody, uh, some comments here that I hope will be some nice takeaways for you as well. Um, someone has said, great speakers, thoroughly authentic, 
and very practical guidance on actions we can take. Um, another person has shared that they are inspired to pick up the phone today and actually ask, are you okay? Others, um, I am now able to think about people who I have put to the back of my mind for a long time and they surface today thanks to this chat and I want to reach out to them as a result. Um, <clears throat> fantastic event, two wonderful speakers. I'm sure that there are many out there who will echo that sentiment. Uh, great backdrop for Are You OK? Um, a couple of things that really shone out to me, um, you know, both Kate and Wayne spoke about a spectrum or a continuum. And I think a key takeaway is that each and every one of us sits somewhere along that continuum or that spectrum. And everybody that we know, likewise, is sitting somewhere along that continuum or spectrum. Um, both Wayne and Kate have given us today some tools and some strategies to make it easier for each one of us to engage, to be comfortable and to have the courage to um, address this topic, whether it's with regard to our own self-care or engaging with another on theirs. Um, another takeaway for me was really we live in a culture and we live in a workplace. And for us here in Australia, we, most of us um, here working in a Dow culture, but we're also part of an Australian culture. And, uh, you know, I, I think it really struck me, Wayne's comments, that in, in Australia, you know, we, we do come across a culture of discrimination and, and stigma. Um, it, it's, it's a hard reality. Um, and a feature of, of, of our culture and, and one that as time goes by, we all have a responsibility and now some extra tools to help um, face off. So um, with that, if there are no more comments coming through on the text line or on the emails, I'll take the opportunity again to say a big thank you to Kate and to Wayne. Um, Thanks to all of the organisers and uh, the participants today. Those of you calling from the United States, uh, getting pretty late in your evening. So we really appreciate you joining us and hope that a lot of the themes that we've brought forward today, of course, they're human themes um, and they're translatable and applicable to um, communities and cultures all around the world. So with that, um, for those of us here on the East Coast, you know, in Australia, it is uh, coming up to lunchtime. So take a moment to uh, pause, reflect on what we've just seen and heard. Enjoy the sunshine before we all get back to work. So thank you very much. <laughs>